Well, welcome to another visit to the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. I'm Bill Goodenrath, and I'm going to be doing today's webcast. It's the third day of a three-day class for me in an introduction to Venetian techniques. And one of the most advanced techniques of all is reticello. It's the name that means little net in English, reticello. And it starts in the 16th century. We don't have many examples from the 16th century, but we have a lot of them from the later 17th and early 18th century. And this actually, this is not a museum object, but it's mine. This is actually an example from about 1710. And it's just like Reticello in Rosenborg Castle. I was showing you in the video last night. And if you look at it really closely, you can see that the canes are very narrow. The white canes are really narrow. And above all, the bubbles at the intersections of every four canes, where four canes cross, there's a void. And that void, when it's fused initially, makes a bubble that's sort of pillow-shaped. It's squarish, the corners are pointed. And the more you reheat, the more the pointed parts recede. And if you heat a lot, the bubbles become spherical. Well, around 1710, and this is just like a piece in Rosenborg Castle, that's why I date it so closely to 1710. The, the canes intersect and the bubbles are absolutely giving the appearance that the glass never got hot enough to do anything other than fuse the canes. It's a real enigma. How did they get it hot enough to shape the object without having all the bubbles become spherical? Well, in modern times, in really recent times, people like Kenny Peeper and Dante, they like round bubbles. So this is a Kenny Peeper goblet, gorgeous. And if you look really carefully, there are bubbles at the intersections, but they're round. And all of Dante's bubbles are round, and they both prefer round bubbles. This is a platter I made some time ago, maybe four or five years ago, and the bubbles are trapezoidal and square, and they're round right in the middle and right at the edges. And this is a piece I did with Martin Yanetsky, rather. Martin Yanetsky did this with my help. I set up the reticello, and all the bubbles are round because he gathered over the reticello, and it gave the bubbles plenty of time to become spherical. There are two kinds of whites that are available today. 25, 30 years ago, white, opaque white glass was at best like 2% milk. Now we get these really great super opaque glasses. And this is the one called Duro. So it's very opaque and it's also really stiff. So a color like this holds its shape really well. You can see the canes are really well defined, just like here. Now if you use a soft, do the same techniques and use a soft white, you get a little bit of bleeding and a little softening and so you wind up with wider canes that are not quite as crispy and sharp at the edge. Reticello canes are traditionally different than normal filigrana canes. These are normal filigrana canes. And these are reticello canes. And they're pretty skinny by normal standards. They're pretty small diameter by normal standards. But this is what achieves that net look that reticello is all about. You know, reticello is arguably, its origin is from the island next door to Murano, Burano, where they made lace since the 16th century. And there's some thought that this is an imitation of Burano lace. Anyway, I've been doing reticello experiments lately, trying to get as good as this hubris there involved, but I'm trying. And so, I've been doing a lot of different kinds of experiments, trying all sorts of different things. And right now, I'm using canes that are about three millimeters in diameter. I've used canes that are about two millimeters in diameter. And I'm gonna show you what happens when you do that. First, I've gotta pull a cane. So I've taken a piece of Duro, I've coated it two times in clear, and pulled a cane about six feet long, about like that. And then I saw that up. You can let that cool off a little. I saw that up and the sections like this. 
and I'm going to pull a cane from one of those, and we're going to pull it over there, so if you want to see it, you're welcome to move over in that area. Here's the setup. Thank you, Matthew. There it is, ready to be gathered over. So I'm going to gather over at the main furnace, and then we're going to pull the cane right over there. And the final cane will be absurdly small in diameter. It'll be about three millimeters in diameter. Thank you. you fill that up from the pipe warm pipe cooler. This is Duro. It's much stiffer than the clear glass. So it's essential to have the area where the duro meets the rod stiff, chilly. Now I'm going to cool the face. And you can beat me over there. No, I, I put them together here. Matthew, you go there. Thank you. And just keep turning slowly. Now this is going to be a silly thin cane. So I pull it much faster than normal. about a, I don't know, 30 or 40 foot pole. The diameter about here. And for the rest of the cane, this is uh, about four millimeters. No, about three millimeters. Thanks. So now we go to the fusing and roll-up process. In the pickup box, I have the plates the ceramic plates with the canes on them. If you look at them, you'll see that they're not oriented as they normally are, perpendicular to the sides of the plate. They're already, they're put at a skewed angle so that the twist is already begun when I do the roll up. So I need to make the collar and I have a roll up for the cup. You know, reticello consists of two parts. I have a roll up for the cup and I have a roll up for the inner part. So this is the correct diameter for the collar for the cup. Okay. 
Do me a favor and grab the gloves under that marver. They're uh, right over there. Just put them on top of my mark, my nailer, please. Now this collar is is normal in a lot of ways, but it's it's different in that the way I've been experimenting with reticello lately, I don't do the usual procedures in a number of ways in a number of areas. And one of them is when I break the cup off, I'm going to break it off right here. Normally, we jack the neck down of the cup and make it narrow and break it off there. The problem with that is that heat and that constriction just damages the canes. So lately, I've been making a neck on the post. It's open and it's about the right diameter. It's not exactly round, but it's going to get a lot of marbling and smoothing. I ask you to take care of this. Needless to say, working solo is unusual. But part of this demo could be titled The Limits of Solo Glass Blowing. <laughs> Reticello is, I, tell, I promise you, it's no more difficult solo than with two assistants. Here are the canes on the plate. Note that they're askewed. Of course, the cup is twisted one direction and the inner part is twisted another direction. So I hope I have these oriented the right way. I have a little cheat sheet right here that tells me the inner part is that way and the cup is that way, and I think I've done it. It's a huge advantage preheating the plates in the annealer. It makes this half of the time it would be were I to reheat cold plates. Hey, Ma Matthew, you could bring that over. Thanks. And now I'm in the solo mode. Thank you. multiple re reheats because it heats the canes to their cores. It makes them easier to manage if something goes wrong. If you heat them really quickly, the skin gets hot, they fuse, but they break apart really easily. And I'm talking about when I roll them up. I'm not great at rolling up, so it's either, there's either going to be an overlap or a little gap. If the canes are barely fused, one can get in over one's head and have it snowball. So now I'm going to see if I can see if I can remove the little end pieces. These are called quaretti. These little end pieces. Once I asked the wonderful Venetian glass artist Johnny Toso what. Quaretti 
means. And he said, little rectangular things. Now I'm going to put the post in. But just for a moment, because I'm going to do one more check for fusing. After the quaretti come off, it's very helpful to do a gentle squeeze this way, because there could still be gaps. There we go. Next to the roll up. The post goes in. Pains come out. Closing up the seam. There's a little bit of an overlap at the moil, at the collar. And there's always kiln that wash. It's always worth brushing off. This is going to be the cup. Back in September, I had the opportunity to work at a wood-fired furnace. I do that every September. I work at a wood-fired furnace for about three days. And the heat is much milder and more gentle. And it fuses and flattens the canes much less. So I just turned my furnace down to 2100. And from the canes being askew on the pickup plate, the twist has already begun. That said, I'm now going to continue tightening the twist. And I start by marvering in place in this direction. Everything I do on the cup will be at the bench toward me, and everything at the marver that way. I'm also diminishing the diameter, reducing the diameter of the moil a little bit, the collar a little bit. And this business of free free heat and low temperature is part of what keeps the canes so sharply defined and makes the bubbles so pretty. Maybe I forgot to say I wait refer the pillow-shaped bubbles. Now at this point, normally, this is heated, the end is jacked down and closed. That does a lot of damage to the canes. So I've come up with, uh, for me, a slightly different way. And I put a, I put a 
plug, so to speak, on the end of this. I'll just park this here for a moment. I can do to not soften the canes too much is good at this point. to elongate the canes a teeny bit. I want to be able to hold the, the end of this and chill the plug. And now begins the business of twisting it tighter and elongating it a little bit. Toward me. Got a little bit ropey, so I'm going to smooth it out. I turn all the time this way to tighten. If there's any torque, it should be the way, if there, the torque should be in the direction that tightens the pull. Now I just blew and I have enough, enough closure. There are leaks, but I have enough closure to allow me to create the cup. I'll give that another. Big enough. I'm, I'm experimenting with different ways to not have to do the following procedure. I'm experimenting with different ways to get the end open and to make a cylinder without having to jack it down. I haven't quite gotten there. So I'll do it pretty much the traditional way. Not quite as extreme. I'll jack it down.
broke a little unevenly. I've done much worse, but I will figure that out eventually. I didn't have to jack down much. I didn't have to heat much. So those canes up near the edge are pretty good. The, the, the goal is to get as much of the cane involved in the final object as possible. And now I have to open it to a cylinder. And just like before, I do this in small steps. top of this is going to never be used. The closest the object will get to the edge is about, about a half an inch. All, all that's usable right up to that broken edge. Now I'm going to put this in the cup holder in the pickup box. First, I'll open it just a tad more. And the upper inch or so is a little smaller than the midsection. That can trap a bubble. There we go. That's fine. Now, you notice when I don't jack down like it's typically done, these canes are all perfectly intact nice and sharp. So there's no damage done to those in this procedure. Bite, 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 and I'm going to break this off. Maybe I'll flash it one more time. This annealer is holding at, one, at 950. That should stand pretty much straight up and down. All right, time for the insert. Now the insert has a just a few, just by chance, has a, a fewer canes. Not it's not quite so many canes, so that's the correct do, diameter for the collar for it. Here I do a normal post. So I hold it up so the face will become bare, blow a bubble to clear the pipe. frankly, have never been great at roll-up diameter control. You know, the relationship between the length of the roll-up and the diameter of the post. I've never been great at that. But with these little skinny canes, it's so unforgiving that it's really sometimes painful to, painful to have it go so badly. If there's a gap, you can close it pretty easily. If there's an overlap, it's a little bit more difficult to manage well. Now, the last one had an overlap. So anticipating that I'm in, a, in an overlap mood today, I'm going to make this a teeny bit, to, teeny bit bigger than I set the caliper. OK. Pastorelli. By the way, this is the Pastorelli. That's the, the plate is called the ferro. It means iron. And Traditionally, this has a crook on the end, like a pastor's, you know, like a sheep herder's hook that became the stylized hook in the church, you know. So this is the pastorelli, like pastor. A lot of people call that the pastorelli. All right, I'm going to put this on hold, put the plate on.
And here everything's turned in the opposite direction. Ages ago in New York at Urban Glass, I was doing glass blowing. Lino was doing a demonstration of Red Cello just, just over there. This is in New York City. And we've been talking about the direction of twists for a few couple of years. Why the Venetians in modern times twist a certain way, why they twist in a different way in, in the Renaissance, etc. So we talked a lot about twist directions. So the, kind, the moment came when Lino lowered the insert into the cup. He blew and he looked up at me with the most loathing look. And he held it, he came over and showed it to me. He twisted both parts the same direction. <laughs> and he said, this is your fault. I never thought about this before. <laughs> it's great. Well, my way of remembering is the cup is nearer, the insert is farther. I turn nearer, farther. So I keep them separate that way. The collar is a little bit chunky. So I'm going to give it a flash. Don't want it to crack up. It's not quite hot enough. You get used to the color of a given glass and a given light, you know, a given clear and a given light glass, and that's just, just short of tacky as I need it. The front end of any furnace is cooler than the back end, but this is a very even furnace, so I don't really need to shift the plate around. goes in. The canes don't need to be too soft when they're this thin or they'll begin to buckle and collapse. Roll up has to be kind of swift so you have a little bit of centripetal force keeping it open. So I got a gap. touch the ends just to stabilize it, make it a little less scary.
Now, during all these reheats, these big reheats, the, the collar is beginning to get a little bit soft, and that'll make it easy to close the gap. It's almost fine now, and I'm going to take a moment before the kiln wash gets melted in, clean that off. And all of my turning should be now in this direction. That tightens the twist. gap right there, a little gap there. gaps that might be there. They're often really hard to see. And they don't open up until the blowing starts. And then it's too late to fix them. So a lot of marver twisting is good. Matthew, could you hand me the big left? Optic mode. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, thanks. This is another really good technique for tightening the twist. It also, it also has the advantage that it makes the end a little smaller in diameter because just like before, I'm not going to jack this down and close it initially. I'm going to keep the, keep the cane stiffer. Now it turns out I have, I just saw I have two or three little gaps there, so I need to deal with that by tightening the twist. One way is to gently press down as I turn. That makes the twist tighter, and that will close up gaps. It's a good way of applying friction, you know, so that you get an even twist from top to bottom. bit of a fold. I'm going to open a little and that'll get rid of the fold. And now I'm ready to close the end.
I just tested the cap on the end, seems to have sealed it. That's good. I'm going to start elongating the canes a little bit. I'll marver a teeny bit in place to tighten the, the twist. this up. It's right now at 950 and that's a fine temperature for picking up parts, but it's not a sufficiently high temperature to keep the cup from cracking if I blow into it and blow really hard, as I have to, to get good bubbles. So I turn this up to 1020 and I have to keep in mind that at 1020 the cup will collapse in about 10 minutes. So I don't want to turn that up too early. Anyway, now comes tightening the twist and closing the end. Here I do jack it down and close it, and I'm experimenting with, experimenting with different ways to do this other than having to close it with the uh, jacking down. But I'm not ready to show you that. Doing that, the end got a little puckered, so I have to blow that out, or that'll trap nasty bubbles. Now, if I'm concerned about this getting too hot, I can always do this. It's good. Before I do anything else, I'm going to get rid of that pucker on the end. when I met the great goblet maestro Caramea, Carlo Tosi, in Venice, in Murano. And he showed me his little showroom, all his pieces. And there were like, I don't know, there were like four pieces of Renicello among, you know, hundreds of pieces. And I said, maestro, maestro. Perché non più reticello? Maestro, why not more reticello? And he said, troppo lavoro. Too much work. <laughs> you see how incredibly much work there is in reticello. I was just looking at the diameter of the cup. I want to be safe.
on building up the heat. I want the whole thing really soft because it's going to take me time to get in there. a little bit of the inner part, the insert exposed above the cup and I need to get that I need to get that further up the moil, up the collar. So I reheat and I hold it up and reheat and hold it up and that's that's a problem that I can fix. Need to establish the neck. And I make the neck far enough away from the collar so that I know the canes are good. That way I won't have to trim the edge. begun the neck. It's about 50% done. I'm going to leave it at that for the moment and I'm going to trim the tail and get rid of the thick glass on the end and identify the part of the reticella that's intact as far away from the blowpipe as possible. And that's where I'll cut it in. Especially for a plate like I'm going to make. You want the two parts, the apexes, to come right together. Of course, one wants to use all the canes, but if you make the net too far north, you'll trap bad pattern and it makes it really all for naught again especially with a platter where the center is the first thing you look at so I think that's a safe place right there Now 
Now while I'm heating it to, tri to trim the tail, I'm beginning to re-soften the whole bubble and the neck in preparation for uh, turning this into an oblate spheroid. That'll be the beginning of the plate shaping. And these brief reheats are part of what's making the keeping the cane sharp and keeping the bubble square. Next, I'm going to get the whole bubble slightly soft and blow it up a little bit and make it the shape of an oblate steroid. have to have a really good neck and shoulder for reticello. It loves to crack from thermal shock. So you need to have a, so you need to have a small neck, a really concave tapering shoulder, and a hot shoulder at the moment of the transfer. The uh, neck and shoulder are now done. I'm going to establish the diameter of the well part of the plate. using the punty in so that it will be ready when I need it. And I'll go ahead and shove it in. I cool the punty site the glass, the clear glass around the pipe, the collar, is a little bit yellow. The end of the blowpipe is slightly red, and that tells me that this, these temperatures are all fine up here. Transfer to the punty. No, no, no. Now, if I were making a vessel with a lid, I could leave some of this and use it for the lid, for example, or a stem or a foot. You can make the neck wherever you need, leaving extra glass for 
other parts. Also, sometimes, because you might need to make the cup first and then those parts, you can divide those into sections, transfer them to other blowpipes, and use them. The great reticello plates at Rosenborg Castle, I think most of which I've handled and studied, counted the canes. That's really tedious. They all have outer folds. The edge is folded, but not inner folds like you always see on goblet feet, for example. They have outer folds. So after I open this a little bit and use the sofietta, I'm going to do the outer fold. Here comes the outer fold. It's the same principle as the inner fold. It's more difficult. It's easier to have it go bad. What I'm going to do is make a flare, squeeze the constriction, and then push the edge up onto the shoulder. this reheating that the bubbles near the rim of all these things begin to get round because you can't open and shape it without softening the glass and that gives it time for the bubbles to become spherical. You can minimize that but you can't eliminate it. shaping this, this is tedious. I know it's many, many reheats. But if I just stay in there, all the bubbles in the sides will get round. So a little bit at a time. that another time. I want this nice and, nice and controlled and perfectly round before I spin it open. And it's important that I get it soft all the way to the bottom edge of the well, or it'll, it'll look like a 
sort of a fusion between a plate and a bowl. So it is an incredible amount of work for a little plate. But there it is, Reticello. Watching. I hope you enjoyed uh, old Reticello with trapezoidal bubbles. Thank you.